You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and today I have the great privilege of speaking with Chris Dillow, the economist, writer, blogger extraordinaire of Investors Chronicle. But first, Chris started as an investment banker and worked at various different entities before joining the Investors Chronicle. And we're going to talk about that a little bit um, throughout this interview. And um, I just want to welcome Chris. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. I know that you've only just retired, you know, just barely a week. Um, So I wanted to start with, you know, congratulating you on your fantastic performance. I've read something somewhere like you must have written about 200 words during the time of writing that column. So, you know, that's an epic, (laughs) you know, uh, number of educational information you've shared with um, the Investors Chronicle listeners and readers. So well done. Thank you. Okay, so Chris, what I wanted wanted to ask you first, if I may, um, is going back because one of the things I read was that when you first started out, you start you started out as a stock as a stockbroking firm, and within a couple of weeks, it was Black Monday, the crash of crashes, which yeah. most people you know of our generation now have, have, have tried to forget about. But markets fell on the Monday, I think it was eleven percent, and followed by the Tuesday of ten percent. What did you learn from that? And what could you share with our listeners regarding what they should consider regarding the fluctuations that we're having? And that's just what we're having at the moment, fluctuations. Yeah. One thing I learned is that returns aren't normally distributed. They're not shaped like a bell curve. Extreme returns are more likely than a normal distribution would suggest. Now, um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb made a big deal of this in his book, The Black Swan. But I can tell you that everybody working in stock markets learned it precisely and learned it the hard way on October the 19th, 1987. And the point, I think, I think generalises in that it's still the case that Um, returns on equities and I think also returns on commodities and bonds tend to see more extreme losses than a normal distribution would suggest. Um, The Harvard economist Xavier Gabe has has suggested that extreme returns follow a cubic power law such that um, returns of more than two standard deviations from the mean do have a particular distribution in that they are predictably more um, more likely um, th- th- than, you, than you'd expect. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, that's, that's one thing I learned. Another thing I learned, um, which was actually written by Robert Schiller back in 1981, is that share prices are far more volatile than the economic fundamentals in that market might have been reasonably priced on October the 16th, 1987, might have been reasonably priced on October the 20th, 1987, but it certainly wasn't reasonably priced on both of those days. You know, share prices are more volatile than you think. And this is something which, which we still see today. No, I, I love that. I mean, I've got this question in here, so I'll, I'll put this in right now. Uh, because this challenged with what something else that Nazim Nicholas Taleb said, and his view was the problem with experts, and you're an economist, Chris, so you can verify this as well. The problem with experts is that they do not know what they do not know. In your opinion, how much credence should investors put on experts' predictions with regards to economic growth or future profitability of entities, stocks, funds, etc.? Um. Taleb was right. They should put absolutely zero weight on it. Um, I direct you here to some work by Prakash Langani at the IMF. He has shown that 
economists have systematically failed to predict recessions around the world. That was true of the 1990s recessions, true of the early 2000s, mild recession, true of the, of the financial crisis of 2008. And that seems to be true across all countries. Now, there's a systematic failure. What does predict recessions is the slope of the yield curve. When the yield curve inverts, there's a very high chance of recession. If the yield curve is, is upward sloping, there's, there's a lower chance. If you want to know whether we're going to hit recession or not, look at the yield curve, ignore economic forecasts. And another piece of research that corroborates Taleb is people looking at how, whether corporate growth is predictable. And there's been research done by the likes of Alex Code, Paul Jaworski, Joseph Lukonishok, which shows that corporate growth is largely random and that people who try to predict earnings growth are, in fact, fail to do so by and large, particularly longer term earnings growth. And we're, we're seeing that this year. I and mean, we've seen it with the collapse of Peloton, Netflix and other shares that were pricing in big growth. The moment those growth forecasts come into question, share price slumps. And the prices of a lot of growth stocks are based on a far flimsier foundation than you'd think. Okay, you've almost, you've almost answered the, the question I've got here um, with regards to the stats and the data and historical research. Historically, with regarding factors that you've seen that causes significant long-term decline of previously highly regarded large cap listed companies. What, what is that, Chris, for you? Um, quite small changes in long-term growth expectations can lead to, to big changes. But also um, what seems to happen is that there are, there are both halo effects such that in a market panic, good stocks can get dragged down. I and mean, during the tech crash of the early 2000s, Amazon share price fell by over 90%. Now, I remember it, yeah. That, that tells us that investors aren't capable of distinguishing good stocks from lousy ones. And certain, they certainly can't do so in a panic at time, times of high volatility. And another thing that happens is that prices tend to overreact. And, and one reason for this um, is that they are prone to momentum, you know, both, both upside and downside. You know, the prices of big US tech stocks um, seem to have been momentum driven, we now know in 21, and now that momentum has turned against them. And that draws attention to one of the big deviations from efficient markets, which is that momentum stocks um, tend to keep rising and negative momentum stocks tend to keep falling. I love that reply. And I think the importance of what you've just said there, Chris, is that I, I, I suspect, you know, and you and I have been in the market for a little while, is that the momentum investors that have caught on to a trend, i.e. Peloton Netflix, late, right, almost near the peak, they are buying in then. And when it starts to roll over, they still think, well, the momentum was going for that long. It's, it's got to come back and bounce and carry on again. Yeah. And often that's not the case. Ab absolutely. And if you are going to be a momentum investor, you have to do it in a disciplined way. And that means you've got to abandon wishful thinking. Yeah. And you've got to have a selling rule. Right. And one of the oldest mistakes uh, in investing is what economists call the disposition effect, the tendency to hold on to losing stocks too, too long. You know, you need some way of fighting against that. And one rule that, that I like uh, was suggested by Meb Faber about 15 years ago when he says, just look at the 10 month or 200 day moving average. If prices fall below that, get out. If prices rise above it, get back in. You know, now, you, you, that rule sometimes doesn't work, but where it does work 
it protects us from very bad losses, you know, um, and 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 that's worth something. Yeah, I've heard the 200 day moving average quoted quite a lot regarding um, investors and um, regarding keeping themselves safe. Um, but you've touched on another aspect of it there regarding, um, you know, the disposition effects. So I'm going to ask this question regarding psychology now. In the grand scheme of long term successful investing, how much importance do you put on investing psychology, Chris? Oh, enormous importance. Um, I suspect you if you are going to be a stock picker, you have to pay more attention to investor psychology than to corporate fundamentals. Because corporate fundamentals, earnings, cash flow and such like, should be in the price, you know, but investor psychology often isn't. You know, I take three examples here. One is, we know that shares are prone to, to momentum. That tells us that investors overreact, uh, underreact in the short term uh, to good or bad news. They cling to their idea that uh, a stock, you know, is a good stock, even in the presence of evidence to the contrary. Second thing is, investors tend to underprice defensive stocks. You know, they regard them as just dull and unexciting. Now, and the third thing, the counterpart to that is that they tend to overprice smaller, smaller speculative stocks. And the AIM index, for example, has pretty much consistently underperformed ever since the late, the late 90s. And it's done so because people think that it, they can get rich quick in, in, in such shares. The upshot is they tend to be overpriced and therefore tend to underperform in the long run. Hence the reason we've got the tortoise and the hare. You know, we've got Kathy Wood, who is the who was the hare, and Berkshire Hathaway that was lampooned for being always been is being surpassed by Kathy Wood. She's the she's got the hate. She had the halo effect, and now we surpassed her again. She's gone up, come down, and she's he's a slowly carried on up there. So, what 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 are your thoughts regarding that um, that strategy really of investing long term and getting rich slowly? Is, is that is that what you are? You're an advocate for get rich slowly rather than Chasing, chasing the hair? Yes, but um, with one, one big caveat here is that um, I don't think it's possible to be a long run buy and hold investor in specific stocks, um, simply because creative destruction, you know, in the long run is, um, is enormously important. And when I was um, starting out as a stockbroker in the late eighties, you know, some of the big FTSE hundred companies were the likes of House of Fraser, Woolworths, uh, British and Commonwealth, Maxwell Communications. You know, a lot of stocks that are now unheard of, and a lot of a lot of which have collapsed. You know, so you can't be a buy and hold investor in particular stocks. What I think you can do is follow particular strategies, uh, one of which is investing in defensive stocks. Um, and that's what, that's what Warren Buffett does. You know, and there's some evidence that Buffett isn't a fantastic stock picker. What he is and has been is a fantastic style picker in that he's gone for defensive stocks with monopoly positions and visibility of, of earnings and cash flow. And it, it's those characteristics that over the long run beat the market. Okay, so with regards to Buffett then, you know, he's been heralded and continues to be heralded and, he's, and so he should be. He's made. He's obviously made some mistakes in his in investment investing over the years, but I think the beauty of what he's done is that he's enabled other people to learn from some of his mistakes. And he actually, when he does make them, he cuts them relatively quickly. Whereas I don't see a lot of other investors doing that. Sometimes they hang on, um, and almost and almost are in denial, as as are some fund managers. And we see that quite often. Absolutely. Why is that the case? I think one problem is ego. 
you know you've got to take ego out of out of the equation you know you've got to know when you're wrong and know when to admit that you're wrong now buffett in a sense has got an easier job here because his reputation is so is so big and, and so secure that he can afford to, to publicly admit that he's wrong. Um, the rest of us, you know, whose reputations aren't so, are, are, are more fragile, don't have that luxury. But even so, we've, we've got to do it. We've got to know when to cut our losses. And as I say, you've got to have some kind of, of, of selling rule. There was a nice paper written by a chap called Alex Imas at University of Chicago recently, where he studied the decisions of American fund managers. And he found that a lot of their buy-in decisions were really quite good. You know, if you looked only at what they bought, they tended to outperform the market. The reason why these guys didn't outperform the market on average was that their selling strategies were so terrible. And he found that they would have been better off just look at, going through their portfolio and selling stuff at random than selling in the way that they did. You know, people... And the reason for that is that people pay lots of attention when they're buying and they regard selling as something to do just to fund the purchases. But it's not like that. You know, you've got to pay as much attention to selling as you do to buying. Very, very good call. I, I'm all, I've almost feel like we're doing a, 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 an interview here about um, Nicholas, um, <laughs> Nazim Nicholas Taleb rather than yourself, Chris. I'm going to ask you a question again because you've touched on the, the the issue of ego and and being fragile about being anti-fragile you've got companies that get strengthened by knocks and you've got individuals that get strengthened by knocks and mistakes how could we embrace actually the learnings we get from the mistakes we make as as investors private investors fund managers etc well one thing um that's worth doing especially if you're a younger investor starting out is to keep a diary, to write down your reasons for buying a stock, write down your reasons for thinking about buying a stock but not doing so, your reasons for selling, and consult this regularly. And you, you might well see a, a, a pattern of mistakes that you make, and you can learn from that. Because it's very easy to have the hindsight bias, you know, and yes. to, to think that, you know, you were right for reasons that you've invented at the time and that you were wrong because something happened that you couldn't foresee, you know, and keeping a diary reminds you of what you thought at the time and why, why you were wrong at the time. But also, I think, like I say, you've got, you've got to take the ego out of it, you know, and you've got to remember that it's not about you, you know, it is about what strategies outperform the market, if any, how much predictability there is in share prices. Um, too many people, I think, rely on individual judgment, you know, when, when picking the stocks or, or, or timing the market, when in fact, what you should do is look at what has done well in the past, you know, and we know that two particular strategies, momentum and defensives, have outperformed over the long run, you know, and possibly only two. And we know that there are some ways in the past of predicting medium term returns, such as the dividend yield, um, ratio of re retail sales to the all share index yield curve, and so on. So rather than ask, what do I know about the market? You know, ask, what does history tell us? I love that. Re love that response, Chris. I really appreciate that. Um, can I ask you then, um, with regards to history? History has often said that the best way to invest is to be a value investor and to look for deep value, um, as that would outperform growth. But we've seen that that's been different on this cycle. Do you think value has a place in some in everyone's portfolio, anybody's portfolio, going forward? Going back to the old staples that could actually do quite well and be potentially recession-proof? Um, I don't like the phrase value stocks because for me, it contain a stock and a high dividend yield, say, is very often one of two different types. Right? One type 
are those that carry lots of recession risk, lots of cyclical risk, you know, like miners and house builders traditionally. Another type are stocks that have fallen out of favour with the market because the market just thinks they've gone ex growth, like tobacco stocks, utilities, telecoms now. Now, stocks that, that latter type of stock, I think, are often attractive right? because of what I said earlier that market investors can't predict long term earnings growth. So they're often mistaken, not just about what's a growth stock, but about what's an ex growth stock. So by all means, look at stocks that are on a high yield because investors are skeptical about long term earnings growth. As for those cyclical stocks, right, they are dangerous. They should outperform really well if we escape recession or when we come out of a recession if, we, if we've had one. Now, but over the long run, you know, I'm not so sure that they do out, out, outperform because what you gain on, on the upturn, you lose on the downturn. And you can lose everything. You know, I mean, back in 2007, the likes of Northern Rock and Bradford and Bingley were, were on great yields. Now, you wouldn't have done well holding them and being a value investor. Very good. Very. Uh, uh, that is a fantastic reply. Thank you ever so much for that. Now, I'm going to ask you that we've, the the conversations about inflation, recessions are, are, are abound at the moment. Um, in the grand scheme of long term successful investing, Chris, with regards to funds, ETFs, equities, commodities, properties, etc., you've touched on them. And you've already mentioned the yield curve. Is there any other strategies that investors could use with regards to assessing whether or not their portfolio, the mix and different allocations, we are heading into recession and therefore they should probably rein it in? You know, you mentioned the 200-day the, the moving average. You mentioned the yield curve. Is there anything else that they should use to actually traverse and consider, actually, I might be overconfident as to what we're facing going forward? One thing is the dividend yield on the all share as a whole. That's a great predictor of medium term returns. But I think you've got to remember that recessions are largely unpredictable, except by the yield curve. There's very little that predicts recessions systematically. And what I think we've got to do is not try and be too clever. You know, remember that there's an awful lot about the future that we just don't know and cannot know. And a lot of people who pretend to know are doing just that. They're pretending, you know, they're offering you um, the illusion of knowledge, you know, um, false comfort. Uh, yeah. What I recommend is simply that you have some kind of balanced portfolio. Don't worry about the weights too much in it because you can never optimize those. But if you've got some mix of equities, cash, you know, gold, if you're a UK-based investor, some foreign currency assets are, are, are a good idea. Maybe so, some bonds if you're worried about the short-term recession risk. You know, but if you've got a balance portfolio across most assets, just, you know, get on with the rest of your life, you know. As you're, as you're going to be doing now regarding your um, retirement, mate. So that's, I love that. Okie okay, okay, dokie. Right. I'm going to talk now about your stumbling and mumbling blog, the fantastic blog. You've been absolutely prolific on that as well as being on, on, um, on the Investors Chronicle. Now, Chris, in one of your recent blogs um, a couple of months ago, you wrote, everybody says we have an inflation problem. Everyone is wrong. What we have is a relative price problem. Please could you expand on this and offer up, if you'd be so kind, as to how best the BOE um, would be guided to deal with this ongoing price problem? Yeah, what I meant by that is that what, what we're generally seeing is not inflation in the sense of all prices and wages going up at the same rate. What we're seeing is very largely a rise in the price of oil, gas and electricity relative to other things. What this means is that 
if you if you own an oil oil or gas field, you know you, you are making it in. You're getting a bigger sharp share of the economic pie, and somebody therefore has got, get, got to get a smaller share of the pie. And inflation is the process whereby this happens, such that in, inflation is associated with falling real wages, which is what has to happen if oil and gas producers are to get a bigger share of the pie. So what, what, what's happening is a redistribution of real resources and real income towards oil and gas producers at the expense of, of the rest of us. You know, and inflation is, as it were, a symptom of this and not, not the fundamental cause. Excellent, excellent reply. Thank you for that. Now, now, now Chris, very cleverly, and I, I love the fact that you wrote this, um, two days on retirement, after re retirement, you made an amazing confession, my dear friend. You wrote, now I'm retired, I can safely make a confession. For years, I've been stealing a living. Please share with us, expand. Um, what I mean by that is that for most retail investors, the amount of general financial advice you need is actually very, very small. You know, For the majority of people, if you set up a regular direct debit into a general global tracker fund, and just keep saving for years and years, you know, you'll do okay. Combination of a general tracker fund plus cash is good enough. Might not be perfect, you know, but it'll see you through to retirement, you know, and I know it worked for me, you know. Um, so, you know, you can finesse that. We can point out that there are ways of time in the market, as, as we discussed, there are strategies that might beat the market, you know, but those involve a lot of work, a lot of faff, you know. So, for a lot of people, save early if you can, save regularly, uh, and that's that's going to be the best you can do. I mean, what I mean by that, therefore, is that I could have written just one article, maybe a long one, you know, <laughs> and, and and just just gone away. So the fact that I was writing articles for twenty five years um, means that there was an awful lot of diminishing returns in there and maybe negative ones as well to the reader. I think to interrupt you, Chris, I think many of the old readers will disagree with you. And I don't think there's any negative returns on what you shared with them. And you were, you were immense in helping them and educating them for those 25 years. So kudos to you, my friend. Thank you. But I like to, right. think, I like to think that if I have educated people, one way I've done so is, is in, in the negative sense in that I've helped them avoid mistakes, you know. And, you know, the, 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 you know, there were two approaches to investing. One is to think of ways that you can make money. The other is to think of ways that will stop you losing it, you know. And I've focused a lot on the latter because I suspect that's what is easier to do. Capital preservation is key. It doesn't matter. I don't. It doesn't matter whether you're in your 20s or or in your 50s, 60s, or 80s. You know, no one likes losing. And and although you know, we'll all say we learn a lot from mistakes and losing. Nobody likes it as an experience, and that's why you know across social media, you never see anyone celebrated for for saying, "Hey, I've made a massive loss." You know, you've had Pershing <laughs> come out just recently, lost billions. SoftBank lost billions. Not being celebrated, are they? No. And what one problem is that we we, we, um, we like to think we can learn from our mistakes, and if we're smart, we can. But you need to have sufficient capital with which to reinvest, even when you're wiser, you know. And if you've lost a fortune, you know, you might be wiser, but there's not much you can do with your wisdom. Absolutely, absolutely agree, and very well, well, very well put. Now, you you. Have written um, quite a lot, and you've touched on it in, in, in numerous articles you've written. And I sense, and, and if please, you know, tell me if I'm wrong here, Chris, that you're a strong advocate for passive investing. Um, please, can you explain your rationale for this and the strategy that you have and you've and you've pursued on a personal basis? Yeah, and basically, we've got lots and lots of evidence that active management just doesn't work 
over the long run. You know, Michael Jensen first pointed this out for US funds way back in the 60s. Burton Malkiel con confirmed it. You know, in the UK, you know, the Financial uh, Conduct Authority did a report on this a few years ago where they pointed out active management didn't work. And um, David Blake at Bayes Business School and colleagues has done, done another report on this. We've got lots of good evidence that over the long run, active investment doesn't work. What complicates that is that some funds, I'm, I'm speaking in the UK here, um, some funds do outperform when small stocks outperform large ones. And, but most funds underperform when large ones outperform. And that's been especially the case in the last few months. Right? And the, re the reason for that is simple. If you're just, say you're picking stocks at random, right? you, you, you just stick an amount in, say, 10 stocks. If one big stock then rises, the index will be dragged up, but most stocks will underperform. Most fund managers will therefore underperform. And that's what we've seen in the last few months. We've seen the UK index being dragged up, or at least held up, by a great performance by the likes of Shell and AstraZeneca. Most shares have underperformed the market, therefore most funds have, have un underperformed. You know? So if, you, if you're going to back active managers, what you need is for large cap stocks, you know, your Shell and your AstraZeneca's to underperform, you know, and therefore for small caps to, to outperform. But we haven't really got a good way of predicting whether that will happen. The upshot of which is, I think that you might as well stick your money into a passive fund, you know, therefore saving yourself fees. And also a passive fund has the advantage of, in effect, it is a momentum fund. Because if the stock rises, it's way fund, it increases. So you've got the advantage of low cost plus a little exposure to, to, to momentum. Okay, so, so with that then, um, with regards to your personal strategy um, for passive investing, how have, how have you made allocations regarding, you know what, I'm going to allocate my ETFs, if that's what you're using, here, there, and there, uh, across this breadth of um, of different um, strategies um, going forward, and then just switch off and have a, a nice walk around Rutland Water and the rest of Rutland. What, what, where have you made your allocations, Chris? So you've got the diversification. Almost all my money has been in global ETFs uh, or, or other sorts of tracker funds, you know, unit trusts. Now, and I have had quite a decent cash weighting for some time um, with that simply because I was close to my target level of wealth and capital preservation is everything. Sometimes I did follow the sell in May, buy on Halloween strategy, you know, which very often worked. But really, it's been very largely a hands off. Uh, approach and one reason for that is that I know my weaknesses you know I might talk about the importance of discipline and avoiding systematic errors but in my personal life I'm not at all sure that I myself have the discipline to, to avoid those mistakes you know Warren Buffett said something important when he said that successful investing isn't about IQ he said it's about character and discipline, you know, and I don't trust myself. And hey, I'm, I'm the guy who's retired, so it, it worked for me. I love your honesty, Chris. Um, and this is, a, there's a massive overconfidence amongst um, fund managers, CEOs, private investors. And I often consider why that is the case. And I'm not sure, you know, um, whether that's because we we need to be almost overconfident before we start or we've had a good run and the market's been very kind to us you know i spoke with mark dampier um a couple of um, podcasts ago and he was saying we've almost been on a a 40-year bull run peter and i think this is might be this might be the end of it you know so there's not been that many people you know you know we've had 1987 2007 8 the recent investors haven't experienced anything of a 
of a recession slash depression where they've had the market stay low, decline again and stay low for a considerable number of time. Do you think that's what's going on, Chris? Overconfidence? Oh, yeah. Um, overconfidence is enormous. Um, not, not just in investing, it's, it's in all walks of life. And one reason for this is simply that if a fund manager does well, everyone wants his opinion. So he gets, he gets a lot of attention. The fund manager who does badly gets ignored and get, gets sacked ultimately. So there's a bias in our attention towards um, fund managers who have done well and who are confident because they've done well. But that doesn't mean that, that that'll go into the future. Also, we've got some evidence from psychologists which show that people who are overconfident are simply more likely to get a job than, than, than people who are underconfident. If someone pitches up for an interview and says, oh, well, well, I don't really know, I'm not sure about that, they're less likely to get the job than somebody who is far more fluent, far more confident, even if their actual knowledge base is the same. Very, very true. That, that touches nicely to the point I'm going to make here, Chris. Um, Chris, since Black Monday nearly 35 years ago, we've seen in recent years the greatest and fastest growth in newly minted millionaires and billionaires. However, you wrote in your brilliant stumbling and mumbling blog, some capitalists want a solution to the cost of living crisis, but not because of morality, but self-interest. Despite the wealth of such capitalists, it often appears that some of these individuals are seeking the attainment and status of respect. Chris, are we nearing a dawn where the highest currency for such capitalists are and is respect? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this is um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, once, once you're affluent enough to afford everything you want, you want, you want things other than material goods. You know, you want ego gratification, respect and acclaim of others, you know, and so on. But I think, I think people have, capitalists have other motives for wanting some solution to the cost of living crisis. And that, that's their own simple self-interest. Um, and quite simply, um, if people are spending all their money on, on the gas bill, they've nothing to spend elsewhere. And that means that if, if you're a retailer, you're struggling. You know, a solution to the cost of living crisis isn't a way of helping the poor. It's a way of help, helping Tesco. It's even a way of helping uh, utility companies because people are, are gonna be able to afford their, their bills. You know, um, occasionally, you know, the interests of workers and the interests of capitalists coincide, you know, and, the cost of living crisis is, is one such example. And unfortunately, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to get worse. I mean, I, mean, I think we've seen that um, from the pandemic, Chris. And, I, and I, I work in and support and volunteer in numerous charities in, in, in the community around Leicestershire. And what, what I've found historically over the near 40 years I've worked in the community is the fact that, you know, if you leave anyone behind, you leave everyone behind because it in fact impairs and impacts the rest of society. And what we actually need is these millionaires and billionaires to actually consider everyone and not just themselves. Instead of seeking respect, they should go out there and actually do more. You know, we see Bono, you know, doing all manner of different things, but actually what he's seeking is respect. He's already wealthy, you know? Yeah, uh, exactly. But, but also it's not, it's not just things like ego gratification and respect. That, that these guys can get. It's like simply higher profits in some cases. You know, if you increase the level of university cre universal credit, you know, you're increasing the revenues of Tesco. Yeah. So we've got well, this massive trend, one of the biggest trends at the moment, and lots of debate going on and billions being poured into ESG, environmental, you know, investing, ethical investing, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a book written a little while ago by, and I've got it in front of me here, John McKay and Raj Sisodia called Conscious Capital. Now, what are your thoughts on this idea of conscious capital or conscious capitalism per se, Chris? I'm really sceptical, I'm afraid. Um, 
for quite a few companies, you know, ESG is, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. You know, there's a lot of people just putting on a front because it's the fashionable thing to do, you know. Yeah, it's possible. of course, the, 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 there are some companies that are, are doing good work to, you know, help address the, the climate crisis. You know. But to a very large extent, these guys, you know, are going along with what's fashionable. They're trying to preserve their reputation, you know. And it is very, very hard, I think, to... And be a large company, especially, and remain remain ethical. You know, it depends what what your ethics are. I mean, uh, you know, but it is really, really difficult uh, to survive as a company if you are paying all your your workers and suppliers very well. You know, if you are dealing with, uh, let's face it, some very unsavoury regimes overseas. You know, it's incredibly difficult. To behave ethically, and we, we, I'm not sure we should even expect that for, for, from from all businesses. I agree that we shouldn't expect something from every business, but I think we should, should. Certain businesses should think far more ethically than they have done. Um, and, and, you know, we see major fines going for almost every industry where they've not looked after, you know, the the, the products, the communities around them, where they've mined, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So more could be done, I think, you know, um, and hopefully it then goes to the bottom line to the poorest uh, within the areas that these companies are as well. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see on that. Right, I want to change it up slightly here, uh, if I may. And one of the major trends at the moment and has been for the few years has been the Netflix effect and um, subscription streaming economies per se, yeah? And you've got Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Disney Plus, et cetera, to name just, just a handful. Um, and we saw, I'm not sure if it was last week or the week before, um, Netflix essentially say, actually our subscription growth has slowed. Um, other people have, of their subscription bases have declined. Now, is this subscription model be facing its first test, a downturn? And if so, how should investors position themselves regarding that sort of streaming model and economy per se? This is, this is a really difficult issue because what, what we're in here is a so-called attention economy. You know, if you think of Netflix's competition, it's not just other streaming services like Apple and Amazon. It's anything we could be doing rather than watching Netflix. You know, it's listening to Spotify, it's watching the BBC, it's going down the pub. You know, it's, viewed in that sense, it's a very, very competitive business, you know. And one thing we know from Warren Buffett is that competitive businesses, it might be great for the customer, but they're not so good uh, for, for the shareholder, you know. and one, one difficulty here is that you can fall into a negative spiral, not just from the point of view of investors, you know, selling because other people are selling, but as your subscriptions decline, it's harder to invest in new programming. Therefore, your, your offering is worse. Therefore, you lose subscribers. Therefore, you, 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 you can't invest in new programming. Therefore, you lose more subscribers. And you, you just get that death spiral. Now, Netflix, touch wood, is a long way from that. You know, but it is, it is a danger. And if investors start attaching a higher probability to it than they do now, then there's an awful lot more downside. In, 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 in the price. Right. So these are really dangerous businesses to, to, to be an equity investor in. Very, very good shout there. I mean, we all recall the fact that, you know, um, the company, you know, the dinosaur that was, or didn't know at the time, Blockbusters could have bought Netflix for peanuts and yeah. that's gone. Now the question is, where does Netflix go if it doesn't carry on growing? Does that become the next dinosaur? You know, and its replacement company, we may not even know the name of it yet. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, you know, like I say, 
turn the clock back 30 years. Look at what were the biggest companies back then. You know, they weren't Amazon, you know, they weren't Netflix. You know, they're a bunch of stuff that, you know, young people today never heard of. You know, never and, heard of and here the, 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 there is something that people tend to underappreciate, underappreciate that what's good for customers isn't necessarily good for investors. What's good for customers is that we get lots of competition. We get lots of new startups. You know, we get established monopolies being challenged. You know, that's great for customers. Absolutely terrible for shareholders. Very, I love that, Chris. Thank you ever so much. Now, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but I'm going to round them all into one now. You've, you've hit retirement, Chris. You've achieved financial freedom. Everybody wants to be in your shoes right now. So everyone's jealous. So just bear that in mind, right? <laughs> how are you, how are you gonna how are you gonna fill your time, enjoy your time regarding the beautiful spaces that you've got around Rutland? Um, you love gardening, you're planning to learn Italian out here, yeah. um, and you, you you love your music. So what are you planning to do now you've got your time to yourself and you obviously you're gonna carry on with your blog. I'm, I'm going to carry on blogging. I'm going to I'm going to read a lot more about economics. You know, so I'm not being quite as stupid in retirement as I have been at work. You know, yeah, there's learning Italian. There's playing more guitar. I'm learning music theory. I'm going to go for long walks. You know, around Rutland Water. I'm going to go. I'm going to do more cycling. You know, I hope to be a lot fitter in in retirement than I, than I was in work. But the thing, the strange thing about Rutland, it's got this weird geological feature, which is that oh, yes. whenever, whenever I cycle anywhere, it's uphill from my house to wherever I'm going, and it's uphill on the way back as well. You know, so I'll, I'm going to try and combat that. Yes, the only the only flat bits I could find around Rutland, Chris, was when I was based at RAF Cottesmore, and around the Oakham side of it, you're in the valley there. There's yeah. not that many, you know, there's not many hills apart from the, the road from Oakham back up to RAF Cottesmore. So, yeah, beautiful that is, part that of the world. That's quite a nasty hill, you know. It's, it's a bit of a hill, yeah, a bit of a hill. Uh, yes. oh, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. We, we, we could carry on talking for another hour, I suspect, and I'll have to join you at some point um, for a walk around Rutland Water. Yeah, that would be I great. I want to thank you uh, for, for taking the time and sharing your insights with our Investing Matters listeners. And I just want to wish you ever so well um, for the many, many years of retirement that you have going ahead. And I know from everybody that you've taught, educated and enabled to make less mistakes and preserve the capital, uh, uh, just, a, a, you know, lots of gratitude to you and wish you all the very best going forward, my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you.